Hi, this is Hank Levi, and today I'm speaking with Doug Clark from the uh, Technical Center at Sigma Aldridge. And hi, Doug. Hello, Hank. How are you? <laughs> Good. When we talk about volumetric, uh, and we talk about you know calculating the tighter value, can you talk about you know why do we have to calculate the tighter value, and, um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about sample size as it relates to that. Okay. Well, first and foremost, when we look at the volumetric system. Um, unlike the coulometric system where the equipment differs, uh, whether we have a diaphragm or diaphragmless generator electrode, the reagents that we use in a volumetric system can be different. We have what's considered a one-component reagent system, uh, which is typically the hydronol composite reagents. Uh, we consider that to be a one-component reagent because it contains everything necessary for the titration of water, of course, except for the water. So any time that water gets into the reagent, whether it's in the bottle, the burette system, the transfer tubing, or so forth, it is going to react and lower the strength of that reagent. And of course, in a volumetric system, because we are using a volume to determine our actual water content, in other words, we're measuring the, the volume of reagent it takes to titrate that water, we have to be very precise to know that that reagent is uh, the known concentration that we've stated. Once it changes, that's going to affect our result. So with a one-component system, it's going to change over time. Um, because of that, we, came, we actually came up with a two-component system. In fact, it's actually a holdover from the pyridine days because pyridine was not as stable as we would have liked to see. Um, somebody came up with a great idea of separating out components. And what they did was they had a part A and a part B. Uh, the only problem was is that before you could use this reagent system, you had to mix the two of them together. So we liked the idea of separating out the components. We just didn't like the execution. So what we chose to do instead was we chose to separate the components and place some of those components into the solvent system. So now, unlike that one component system where you could use just any ordinary methanol that was available, you have to use a specific solvent system here because it's going to contain two of the necessary components for the reaction. Now, when we start looking at the Carl Fischer reaction mechanism, we're going to find out that it's actually a two-step reaction mechanism. And in the first step of that reaction, we are actually reacting methanol with sulfur dioxide. And, of course, that's going to form a methyl sulfurous acid that needs to be neutralized. And when we neutralize that with the imidazole base that we use, we're actually producing an um, alkyl sulfide intermediate complex, which takes part in the second step of the reaction. So with our two-component solvent system, we basically added sulfur dioxide and imidazole to the methanol that we would normally use for a titration. So when we look at the titrant, it is simply a solution of either methanol or ethanol, because we have both, and iodine. So if we tried to use the titrant system with ordinary methanol, of course, nothing would happen because it's missing the sulfur dioxide and the imidazole. Right. And, and just so, a layman's term on that, then, I guess, is that by having the, the two-component system, because you're not mixing the two together, you... you you can get longer stability with the uh, with with the titrant. And exactly, that's that's what's okay. that's what's giving you the the long shelf life on that one and the long stability, uh, as opposed to what the composites would have. Got it. I see. Doug, can we just jump into sample size real quick on the volumetric? Yep, that sounds good. Okay. With the volumetric system, um, we need to be concerned about sample size. And the reason for that, of course, is that if we talk to the instrument manufacturers, they're going to tell us that for every titration we perform, we should de design our analysis so that our sample consumes approximately 10% uh, to 80% of whatever burette volume that instrument happens to have. Um, for us, our recommendation has always been to shoot for approximately 50%. The reason we shoot for 50% is that if we... Um, you know, have misjudged our water content of our sample or there's some variability amongst it, hopefully we're always going to fall within that 10 to 80 percent window. Uh, we never want the instrument to use less than 10 percent because then it's out of the optimum operating range for the burette system. And we really never want it to exceed 80 percent because we never want this burette to have to refill in the middle of a titration. 
when it refills in the middle of a titration, there is always that potential that they may pick up an air bubble during the refill process. And because, of course, we're not sitting here watching it real closely, it may accidentally dispense that air bubble, and that's going to change the results that we're going to see. So we really want to be careful about this and calculate the correct sample size. Uh, the other thing that we have to worry about, of course, is that if we do not introduce enough water, um, the instrument's actually not going to give us an actual result. In fact, I've had customers come up with zero, and they wonder what's going on. So uh, we've come up with a nice little formula, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, we take one half the burette volume times the tighter value, and we're simply looking for a tighter value of either 5, 2, or 1. And we're going to divide that by our expected water content expressed as milligrams per gram. That way we can get a sample size in grams. Uh, the reason this is so important, again, is that we make sure that we introduce enough moisture to the system so that we do you know, get an accurate result for it. Because um, if we don't, we can actually come up with a zero value. And, of course, if we get a zero value, we know something's wrong because everything has some water to it. Good. Okay. Uh well, that's good. And, you know, you'd mentioned 5, 2, and 1. I, I'm not sure if we expanded on that, but the composition comes in three different strengths, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the, with the composite reagents, you can get that in a 5, 2, or a 1. The number indicates the milligrams of water that one mil of that reagent will titrate. So if we're looking at something that is relatively high in water content, we're going to want to choose the composite 5. Uh, as the water content decreases, of course, now we have the option of switching from the full-strength reagent down to something of lower strength, either composite 2, because that will titrate 2 milligrams of water per mil, or even composite 1, which will titrate 1 milligram per mil. So that's an option right there for you. Um, the other thing, of course, if we do our sample size calculations and we find out that uh, maybe perhaps the sample size is too large with our current setup, what should we do? Well, we have, of course, the option of changing burette size. Um, that's really important. If you're using a 20 mil burette and you suddenly find out that uh, after doing the calculations, maybe let's say you'd have to have a, a really large sample, we can cut that burette size down. And that's the first thing that I would approach doing. And then after that, of course, we can reduce the strength of the reagent. That's one of the reasons we offer the, the composite 5, the 2, and the 1, so that we can deal with any of that without having to dilute the reagents ourselves. Right. Yeah, I mean, the main thing here is that we look at whatever our setup is, uh, and we may have some constraints. We may only have one available burette, so that's why having the different strength reagents is an option. Sometimes we have to utilize both options, changing the burette size and, of course, changing the reagent strength to pair that up with our, our samples. And, you know, right now maybe we're focusing on the idea of the uh, sample size or the sample contains less water than we expected, but it can also go the opposite direction. When we run across something that's got a lot of water that we have to analyze, if we had a small burette with a low-strength reagent, that wouldn't be appropriate either because, of course, then the sample size would become very small. Right. So, you know, it can go either direction. It really just depends on, on what we're trying to accomplish as far as our sample is concerned. Great, great. All right, Doug, so, well, great. I um, I think we covered some, some good material today talking about the Warhol Fisher and why and whether that the one-component system and the two-component system and, and uh, calculating sample size to finish up. So I think those are all really popular topics to talk about. I think these are the, these are the things that people want to know about most of the time. And so um, and if we have more questions, we'll get together again and do this again. That sounds good. Do you have comments or questions? Give us a call at 800-998-6429 to speak with a representative.